get slow Your will is my law I'ma let you be the boss Cause I'll go where you go I'll take you to a place We can see it all Step off the edge I can break your fall Your will is my law I'ma let you be the boss Cause I'll go where you go When you fall down I'll get you back up again Everybody. Hey, welcome to another Friday live show of the Advantage live show. Thank you guys for tuning in again, as always. Thank you all. So this is the part of the show where we just hang out for just a few minutes, let everybody kind of settle in, get situated. We call it the hangout. Let us know that you're here. Say hello, welcome, or whatever you would like to say. We do enjoy having you guys here. Thank you guys, as always, for coming. Um, so today's going to be a great show. We're going to be talking about why actively listening is key to real estate success, which is brilliant basic number four. I actively listen. I really do. So that is the title of that. Then we're going to go into another segment. It's called How to Create Your Goals as a Real Estate Agent, a five-step guide. We're coming towards the end of 2021. Going into 2022, it's a good time to start setting some goals. So that's what that topic is going to be about. We're going to cover some news as well. So, I mean, this market is doing some just some crazy things right now. So it's kind of cool to see what's happening and to keep our finger on the pulse on what's going on. Um, but before we get into the news, let's talk about this a little bit of um, housekeeping here. If you have a question for me uh, during the whole show, just put Q followed by your question. That way I know it's a question and I can bring that up on the screen and answer that for you. Um, also, if you're watching this on the replay, please put hashtag team replay in the comments just so I know that you've watched this after the live show and we can say hello and thank you. Um, also, um, one more thing we want to say is um, just, you know, be engaged with us. I ask questions even after the live show. Let's. I'll, I'd love to know what the community is, where you guys are from, and so forth. So just feel free to come back anytime and leave comments for us. It just helps us to kind of know where people are watching this from. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, let me just 
say this. Uh, let's go ahead and go into the real estate news because it's it's been an interesting market again, as always. Um, we're going to talk about this one first. Uh, few, fewer new contract signings compared to prior month and one year ago. Um, so we're seeing a little bit less uh, contracts uh, being signed. Uh, preliminary data indicates that new contracts signed pending sales were down about 1% compared to the rolling four-week new contract signed in the prior month. New listings in the past four-week period were also down about 1% compared to the prior month. The decline in pending sales reflects the seasonal decline in the fall months compared to the summer months and the normalization of sales from the surge in sales in the second half of 2020. So it is a typical trends. We start kind of seeing a little bit of a dip in the sales and the new contracts, but we're also seeing a little bit of that due to the properties not really coming to the market or, you know, not as many properties for sale. So we're starting to see that dip as well, but it's a typical trend that we start seeing these numbers go down a little bit in the fall. So nothing too alarming there. Medium home sales price are up 12.4%. So we're still seeing a little bit of an increase there. The median existing home sales price rose 12.4% year over year. Prices are rising at a slower pace with demand continuing to soften. So again, it's kind of what we're seeing. The demand is going to soften a little bit because we're at some point we are kind of uh, outpacing the market, what people can afford. And so when that starts happening, people to buy less homes, therefore the demand kind of goes down. So a little bit of a cooling market. Um, so this is this is kind of good stuff, really. This is it's okay to see these type of things. Uh, mortgage application uh, decrease applications for a home purchase decreased four point nine percent from the prior week and twelve point six from one year ago. Uh, monthly mortgage payment outpaces wage gain. We keep talking about this week to week, um, and it kind of just keeps going that 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 same kind of trend. We're starting to see this every week. So the 30-year fixed mortgage rate uh, rose to 3.05. Last week, if you were here, you saw it was like 2.99 was that week's average. Now we're hitting about a 3.05. So it ended up just a little bit, but that's because of a little bit of inflation. It slightly ticked up to about 5.4%. So they're, they're playing the market a little bit. If they raise that interest rate just a little bit, then it helps to bring that market back down and the inflation slows down. The, the goal here is to st is to slow the inflation. Um, that way it keeps it at more of affordable for people to buy the home. NER chief economist Lawrence Young expects the 30-year fixed mortgage rate to increase to about 3.6% now to, in 2022. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plant pans out. 36 is still pretty low. It's obviously not as low as we've seen here lately, but it's still it's still a really, really low um, interest rate. So again, trying to cool the market a little bit to slow the inflation down so the affordability index doesn't go out of, out of whack there. Um, loans and forbearance. So this is a question we're asked a lot is like, are we going into a foreclosure, you know, know, dump and we're gonna have a lot of homes entering the market, those type of things like we have seen back in like 2008 and 2009. Uh, still yet to see, but here is a good report is loans in forbearance falls to 1.1 million. So put that in perspective, loans and forbearance decreased to 2.28% of mortgages, which is equivalent to about the 1.2 million uh, mortgage mark, which is, you know, at, a, at the peak, it was 4.3 million. So, you know, with over 3 million, do, 3 million um, homeowners have now come out of forbearance plans. In other words, they have worked something out with their bank to stay in their home. So we saw a major reduction in the amount of forbearance. So this is, this is really good news. We're not really seeing the makeup that it took place in 2008, 2009, that led to the crash where a lot of homes were dumped onto the market. Not saying we won't see some of that, but we're not seeing you know a lot of that happening because banks are a little bit more willing to work with the person um, to ba basically keep them in their home. So there's a lot of uh, modifications taking place and stuff on their home. So it's this is all kind of good news. Um, housing starts and permits fall in September 2021. Um, so basically the new start of, of new construction. That's that's what this is talking about. Housing starts and permits fall. Um, here's what it said. Housing starts measured on a seasonally adjusted annual rate fell 1.5% in September from the prior month to 1.55 million. Okay. Supply of construction labor is tightening with a number of unemployed construction workers at just 448,000 compared to the pre-pandemic level of 531,000. Supply issues remain as indicated by the cost of raw materials, while the cost of softwood lumber has fallen by about a third. The cost of fabricated structural metal pre products is up 36%. So we're seeing an increase in production, but it's not to the level we need it to be, so the construction costs come down. So we're seeing adjustment there as well. 
Just like we were talking about in the real estate market, as far as the sales of the properties, we're seeing in the in the industry, uh, in the industrial industry as well to bring those costs down. Um, so as uh, production ramps up, those costs come back down. So hopefully we'll see this kind of pick back up, and hopefully we can keep this trend going, and people can start getting back to work, and production starts increasing. So come spring of 2022, we start seeing more new construction homes, which will obviously help our market. So this is all really good news. Basically, we, we kind of do need to see a cooling of the market to, in some regards, uh, especially when it comes to the power of inflation. Um, the homes have just really exploded in cost. And people are, are just, you know, kind of like, oh, it's more than I want to pay at this point. So they're holding off. So we need it to cool. So it, it's, it's good. Um, just a disclaimer, all of these numbers are provided by the National Association of Realtors, Dr. Lawrence uh, Young, his team. Um, you can pick up these reports at nar.com forward slash reports. Um, and I just like to keep you guys updated on these things because as real estate agents, it's our job. We got to know what these numbers mean. We got to be able to answer the question, how's the market? So hopefully you guys are empowered by this stuff and you saw some value in that. Let me know if you did. Deb, hey, hi, hi. I, well, you're hanging out in Corbin. Awesome. <laughs> Gotta love Corbin. Little little ways from home, but that's good, Dad. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, guys, let me know you're here. Say hello. It's good to see you guys. Thank you all for watching. All right, at this point of the show, well, at this point of the hangout, we're going to start the show. So here we go. Welcome to the Advantage Live Show. My name is Adam Gullett. I am the Director of Growth with Center 21 Advantage Realty in the beautiful state of Kentucky. You are watching the Advantage Live Show. You're either watching this live right now or you're watching it on the replay. If you are watching on the replay, please put in the comments, hashtag Team Replay. I love to know that you are watching this even after we went live. And we can engage with you, welcome you to watching, you, watching the show, and thank you for doing so. So thank you guys so much for being here as always. I so, so appreciate it. So today we've got a, a really fun show. We're going to be talking about two different things. Um, we're going to be talking about brilliant basic number four, which is I actively listen, I really do. And then we're going to transition into the, the coach's corner. And we're going to be talking about goal setting, a five-step guide on how to do that. We are coming to the end of 2021 and getting ready to start at 2022. And we want to make sure that we have some goals set that are related to our business and what we want to accomplish. Because I personally, I love goals. I think goals are one of the best things that we can do as far as agents and as people to keep us on point. It is goals about setting and setting the goal and hitting every single one of them. No, but it's something you strive for, right? I think we all, we can all agree that we set a lot of goals, but we don't hit all of them. But as long as we continue to move in that direction, we are growing. And that's the beautiful thing about goals. So that's what this show is going to be about. It's going to be a fun, just a great time. I will be asking questions throughout the show. I love participation. So if you are watching this live, please uh, drop in a comment. Let's bring it up and let's have some conversation in regards to these questions. If you're watching the replay, make a comment as well. We'll answer it in the comments after the show. So thank you all as 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 always. Um, Emily, hey, good. Olive and I are watching. <laughs> That's cute. Her baby girl. That's so precious, Emily. Thank you so much. And thank you. Yes. Thank you for always being here, Anne. True value, true value. Thank you all. All right, uh, let's go ahead and start with the uh, Vantage segment. I actively listen, I really do. All right, we are going to be talking about why actively listening is key to real estate success, the benefits of being an active listener. And this is actually coming from the brilliant basic. The brilliant basic number four, I actively listen, I really do. I actively listen, I really do is the brilliant basic. All right, so Here's the question for you though, and this is this is something just to kind of get the conversation started. So I want you guys to think about this question and answer it in the comments. Give one word that describes how a really good listener makes you feel. Someone that when you're talking to, to them, when they listen to you, how does that, that person sitting there listening to you make you feel in that conversation? So go ahead and sound off in the comments about that. Um, and as you guys are typing those in, let's talk about this brilliant basic. Number four, I actively listen. I really do. 
Here is the statement that backs up this brilliant basic, and it reads like this. I ask questions, I actively listen, then interpret client needs to create a memorable experience. I understand my client's specific needs, identify their preferred communication style, and then tailor the process to deliver the extraordinary experience. Now, there's a lot inside of that statement that we can even unpack, and I'll do it really briefly now, and we'll kind of break this down a little bit more. But the, the very first beginning part is ask questions and actively listen, then interpret clients' needs. That is a active listening person. It's someone that is act, asking those very open-ended questions, and then they're sitting there listening when they answer that question, and then they, they use that information to make sure that what they're tailoring the response to be is to the benefit of the need of the client. And then it goes on to say to create a memorable experience. We can all agree, and we were talking about this last uh, last episode, we were talking about basically creating a, an experience. People have moved beyond just salesmanship and constant rhetoric about how great you are. They are looking for a wonderful experience that leads them to the purchase and sale of their property. That's what they're looking for. If you think about it, when you go to any type of uh, franchise, they create a system of processes that is tailored to catering to that individual and helping them to be able to have a wonderful, peaceful experience. And that comes from this brilliant basic. I actively listen. I really do. All right. Yes, Jessica said, important, taken seriously. Yes, taken seriously. Good. Thank you, Jessica. Awesome. Um, here is some tips from some top agents um, that had basically was asked the same question. Here's what they had to say. Selling isn't telling, so stop talking about yourself and your results. Ask questions and find out what your client, cl client truly wants and needs. I think this is actually addressing a bigger issue here. Uh, to be honest, if you go into social media right now, you can see a lot of people bragging about how great they are. Now, I'm not saying you can't just tote and say how, you know, properties you sold and those type of information. That's all good. It's marketing. You got to do that. But what if you tailor the posts you made asking engaging questions of the people that are, uh, you know, participating in your community, questions that actually validate where they are. Like, how can I help you find properties? What is your biggest struggle that you see in trying to find financing? What's the what's one of the things holding you back from buying a home? What are some of the issues that you've had in the past of selling your home? How can I help with those type of things? What if you engage the community with those type of questions? So selling isn't telling. So stop talking about yourself and your results. Ask questions and find out what your client, client truly wants and needs. Wants and needs. Next one said this, head nods, maintaining solid eye contact and waiting until they're done speaking to comment. Don't interrupt. Make clients feel like you're hearing what they have to say. I think we can all agree with this uh, statement very well. You'll be sitting there talking to somebody and they constantly will say, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh. There's all that kind of, they're, they're just biting at the bit to start saying what they want to say, right? And they're just taking it and just kind of, okay, we, I wish you'd stop talking so I can then start talking. You don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that just waits, right? Just take take your time, let the person complete their full sentence and then begin to talk, right? The last one is this, get to know your client. Take the time to learn who they are. Then be proactive and about their dreams, finding out what their dream is is find out what their passions are get involved with them and then begin to get to know them that's what we want to know we want to be able to understand and know our clients okay here is a quick test for you guys all right this is but no 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 worries this is literally just a yes or no okay i heard, you guys probably heard test i might have lost viewers immediately as soon as i said test <laughs> All right, quick quick test. There it is. Yes or no to these. All right, here we go. When someone begins speaking, I and you don't have to answer this in the comments. I mean, we're you know, I don't want you to be really transparent here. This is just something just answer yourself. All right. Um quick test. Here we go. When someone begins speaking, I think about what I am going to say. Yes or no. I have difficulty with silence. <laughs> there you go. I think that listening to some people is a waste of time. Oh, I may think of other things while I appear to listen to the person talking. My mind wonders. 
I may interrupt the person talking with suggestions for resolutions. Suggestion for resolutions. I sometimes complete a form or make a note while the person is talking. I stop listening when I know what the other person is going to say. (laughs) I may daydream while the other person is talking. I have trouble remembering what others say to me. Others have told me I am not a good listener. <laughs> I would say uh, if you have some people in your life um, that tell you that you're not a good listener, uh, that, that's got to be somebody really close or, wow, you got some really tough friends. <laughs> so, that's, But that's good. We all need that. Really, that, that's a very honest friend, that accountability. That's really, really good. So hopefully you, you answer some of those questions, yes or no. You Maybe write them down, but maybe in your mind you thought, mm, am I guilty of that? You know, because I, I got to be honest too on my side. Yeah, I'm guilty of a lot of that. Because we get caught up in our own moments and our own agendas and those type of things. And we, you know, we're ready to go, man. Like, especially if you're a type A, you, you just want to go. You, I mean, you're, you're like, okay, let's just get to the point. Let's get over this and let's go on. But the funny thing is, even though the person might be irrational or going through some stuff and rambling, there is meat inside of what they're saying. You can begin to get to know that person and your client and their needs and their dreams, right? So it's very good. All right, here's another question for you. How could poor listening impact a real estate transaction? How could poor listening impact a real estate transaction? Sound off. Give it in the comments. What are some of the things that you can do or not do while listening that will impact the transaction when your client is speaking? And then a follow-up question to that is how can being an amazing listener impact your real estate business? Love your input on this. Let's dissect this a little bit. Leave it in the comments. How can be an amazing, how can being an amazing listener impact your real estate business? What is it that that would do for you if you were an active listener in real estate? All right. Uh, looks like Denver, uh, Denver Gullet, my, my dad, uh, was going back to one of the previous questions. He said, valued. Yes. When someone listens to you, you're valued. You feel valuable. Yeah, that's good. Uh, thanks, Emily. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, Terry, yes, get something wrong in a contract. That's absolutely true. That's good, Terry. So yes, if you're not actively listening to what they want, you might either A, misinterpret what they want, write it wrong in the contract, and then end up having the contract signed by all parties, and now they're under contract, and it's not exactly what they intended to do. So yes, that is a good one. Get something wrong in a contract. That's a big one. That happens, though. It happens all the time. That's really good. Keep, keep sounding off, guys. We'll bring those back up, and I'm going to move on forward, but I'll, I'll bring those up as you guys post. The three levels of active listening. So what is active listening? Okay, because you, you might have heard that term, maybe not, but active listening, right? What is that? Um, so this is actually, uh, there's three levels to this that takes place. Um, level one is internal. It's an internal, um, we are listening to ourselves, we're listening to, with our agenda, you know, so a moment when someone starts talking, we internalize what they're saying and line it up maybe with our own worldview, our own opinions, maybe our own agendas. That is what internal active listening is. You are focusing on yourself and what is going on with you in regards to what they are saying. So sometimes it has a place But a lot of times when you're dealing with a client, it can be detrimental because you're aligning what your desires are outside of listening to what theirs are, right? So that's a very interesting way of actively listening. Maybe has its place, but a lot of times can derail your relationships. Level two is focused. Now, this is a good one. We are focused on what the other people are saying, focused on their words. We're listening actively to what they are saying. We're not putting anything that we have onto them and what they're saying. We are listening based on what they are saying. We're not making assumptions. We are listening to what they are saying to us, all right, and then making sure we understand that. Level three is contextual listening. Ooh, contextual listening, right? We listen with words plus nonverbal cues. We're looking at eyes and, and eyebrows and foreheads and face and lips and mouths and shoulders and arms and hands, maybe posture. We're looking at the way they stand. We're analyzing this while we listen. So if you think about this, taking all three of those levels, that is active listening. Okay, so when someone's talking internally, yes, you've got to do some internal focusing. So you have to be able to understand 
what they is. You begin to categorize what they are saying, but then you don't make it based on what you want and your agendas, but then you focus on what they are saying and only the words they're saying get all assumptions out of the way. Then you contextualize that conversation by listening and looking and observing the way their posture is. There's many ways that people can come across wrong. If you, and you've experienced this through text messaging. How many times have you interpreted a text message with the wrong attitude? That would be approaching that text message internally versus focused on the words that they are saying. And that's why emoji cons even exist. We use emoji cons to make sure we don't confuse the actual text that we're reading. It's the way to re, to basically relay in a in an environment that doesn't have this face-to-face -face you know connection. So we are contextually using emoji cons with our words to make sure that it's not misconstrued. So that is combining all three of those things to be an active listener. So that is the only reason we have emoji cons. So most people like them, some people don't. I do like them because I don't want my words to be confused. I want people to understand my, my emotion and my reasoning for using those words. Um, yes, uh, Emily. Folks know when you're really listening are, and are genuinely interested. Emily, that's absolutely true. Uh, they know. People can read you. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I don't remember the exact data that I read about this, but there, there are micro movements that take place that we are programmed to understand in the face of individuals. A slight eyebrow will relay a different emotion inside of us that we reconnect with that person. And it's almost amazing how much just a slight change in the lips or head can relay a lot of information. So by observing and listening to them, you can see exactly what they're trying to say. And you're not actively trying to put your own agenda on them, but you're just observing this person and you're listening to what they're saying. That's really, really good. Ann Reynolds, getting to know your client wants and needs. Yes, getting to know them. And know is the key word there. What is knowing somebody? It's not just it's not just basically based on all just your initial conversation, but it's kind of diving a little bit in with them and talking about like what their family's like, what they how they grew up, where they grew up, what they, what they like, what they dislike. Get to know your clients' wants and needs. That's good. Thank you, Ann. All right. Now, why would why should we be better at listening to our clients? Why should we be better at listening to our clients? Here's some points. Understanding what is important to others. It's the first step to understanding. You're not going to be able to understand your clients if you're not first listening. You're going to be doing the internal dialogue inside of yourself and your own assumptions if you're not actively listening. You will not understand them. Then that will gives that gives you the stability to your relationship. If you're really working like what like what Ann said here, getting to know your clients' wants and needs, then when you're doing that, you are building a relationship. You are connecting them. You are connecting with them on a human level level. And that is something that we have got to get really good at doing. That is I'll kind of bunny trail here a little bit, but we got technology and big companies trying to insert themselves into our industry right now. That's what these brilliant basics are about. They're about making sure that we do not, do not neglect the brilliant basics that keeps us grounded in the true value that we deliver to our clients. And this listening thing is so, so key. Those big companies do not listen to the needs and the wants and the desires and the dreams of the individuals that they're serving. We do. So when you start talking about the value that a real estate agent brings to the transaction, this is it. When you begin to understand these things, you are bringing value to that relationship and you are actually bringing value to you as a real estate agent. Therefore, you are now needed and are not irrelevant. Sorry, I had to de digress just a little bit because I thought that was so important. All right, it is crucial if you want to truly connect with the people in your life. It, 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 this is valuable. All friends, family, clients, this is crucial to learn so we connect and understand that we're human and we want connection, we want to understand, we want relationship. Develop empathy and understanding of things we may not have any knowledge about before. By actively listening, that is absolutely true. And finally, get a better sense of what people think and feel about certain situations. Everybody's going to have a different response depending on the situation, right? So we're going to be able to understand our client, our family, and our friends better if we're actively listening with all three of those levels. We're going to be able to understand and relate to them better. So 
There you go. Uh, stay, stay snow. Boom. <laughs> That's right. I, I got something for that. Solid go. <laughs> That's good. Stacy, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, um, so how to listen contextually. Here we go. Step one, set your own agenda aside, quiet your mind, put aside your judgment, focus on the client, not on what you want the outcome to be. We talked about this. Step one, set aside your own agenda, quiet your mind, put aside your judgment, focus on the client, not on what you want the outcome to be, right? Step two, listen for what is really being said, what is not said, and what is behind the words. Listen for what is really being said, what is not said, and what is behind the words. Okay, that's good. What are, here's another question for you guys to answer. Sound off in the comments. What are some ways you show your clients you care and truly listen to their needs and concerns? I wanna hear from you guys. What is it that you guys do that show your agent or your clients that you care and truly listen to their needs and concerns? Sound off, share, share your wisdom, impart it to us, impart it to everybody in the comments. I will bring you guys up. All right, what are the set of circumstances surrounding the client situation? So here are some questions that you can basically use to kind of frame the way you're thinking and the way you're listening. So here it is, the what, okay, the what. What does the client need most? So when you're sitting there listening to them speak and you're watching them contextually, what does the client need most when they're talking? What is it that they're trying to relate to you? What is important to this client? What are their appearance and their language telling you? What is their lifestyle like? How many kids do they have at home? What kind of garages do they need, right? What is their lifestyle? Now we start focusing on the how. How are they motivated? How do they make decisions? How do they give and receive feedback, right? That, now that's the how, right? This is the how you begin to listen contextually to the people that you're serving. So really the bottom line to this whole thing is based by creating an active listening environment around the relationships that you have, you are creating a very memorable experience. So think about an experience where you go to a restaurant and the waitress comes up to the table and she learns your all's names. She walks away, uses your names the whole time. Then you found out that you really loved that restaurant. You thought it was a great food, wonderful place. You have now put it on the list of your top restaurants. I'm gonna go there at least once a week, maybe once a month at least, all right? And you go back to that restaurant and that, that waitress comes back up to you and says, well, hello, Mr. Gullah, it's so good to see you again and your family. There's your Hannah, your wife and your kids and she names them all off. Think about that experience that just took place. Are you going back to that person? Are you going to go back to the, make sure and go ask that waitress, hey, where's, where's, where's that table at with that waitress, right? Where, where is she serving at today? Are you going to ask for that table? Because that was a memorable experience. And that's just on a restaurant scale, right? What if happens if you actively listen to the, to the clients that you have and, what, and the way you're serving them and their needs and wants? What kind of outcome would that create for you? What kind of value are you truly giving back? Are they going to come back to you again? My bet is yes. And here's the thing. The moment you begin to build a contextually listening environment with your clients, you've imparted a huge amount of value back into them. So now think about this. When an issue comes up in a transaction, it's going to make it a whole lot easier to navigate that difficult situation if you have made a lot of deposits in that relationship. Because when things get rocky, they tend to want to blame the realtor or blame other people involved. But if you have spent the time listening to their needs and you've done everything you can to take care of them, in the end, they're going to understand the value that you have in regards to that situation. And they're going to relate better to you. And they're going to be more understanding in what you're trying to say and how you're trying to navigate that situation than if you hadn't. So just think about that. Here are some quotes for you guys. Doug Larson said this, wisdom is the reward you get for a lifetime of listening when you'd have preferred to talk. Brian McGill said this, one of the most sincere forms of respect is actually listening to what another has to say. Robert Baden Powell, if you make listening and observation your occupation, you will gain much more than you can by talk. There is as much wisdom in listening as there is in speaking. And that goes for all relationships, not just romantic ones. Daniel Day Kim. And Stephen Covey, 
Everybody knows who Stephen Covey is. If, if not, Google him. A lot of great books. Big fan of him. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. There you go. That's some people that are way smarter than me talking about this very subject. So heed their advice. I love quotes because it pulls out some valuable nuggets out of these people's lives that really, really have figured out a lot and been through a lot. So there you go. What we got here? Uh, yes. All right. Good. Guys, thank you so much. Oh, one final question before I wrap this up. And you can answer this in the comments or just for yourself. Final question. What steps are you going to start taking now to become a better listener? There you go. That's the question, right? We are all on a journey of trying to better ourselves, or at least we should be. We never arrive. We are always the student, never the teacher. That's what I've enjoyed about doing these type of things is I'm learning a lot myself and I'm learning it along beside you guys. And that's what makes this such a great way of communication and being able to grow together. So thank you all. Answer that question. Um, I know I am. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that segment. We're going to transition now over to the coach's corner, and we're going to be talking about how to create your goals as a real estate agent. And it's a five-step guide to do so. We're at the end of 2021. So let's get into this. Let's go. All right, we are going to be talking about how to create your goals as a real estate agent, a five-step guide, okay? So here's a question for you before I get into the content for this. Do you set goals every year for your real estate business? If so, what type of goals do you find motivating? Sound off in the board. Sound off in the comments, I'm sorry. Sound off in the comments, let us know. Do you set goals every year for your real estate business? If so, what type of goals do you find motivating? All right, you know, we talk a lot about goals. I mean, if, if you've been in business for yourself at all, we talk about goals all the time. Oh, you got to set your goals. You got to set your goals. And I do agree with that, but it can get so redundant so much and it just kind of wears you down. It's like, oh, goals, goals, goals. And then you end up forgetting the goals. It's like New Year's resolutions, right? It's like I set it at the beginning. I might have a month worth of great success setting my goals and moving my progress and then I slowly forget them. So I, I, and I do get that. Um, I'm guilty of that as well. I think all of us can relate, um, but... It's still a practice that we should do every single year, month, week, whatever it is, however you want to break those things down, we should still set goals. And that just keeps us driving forward. We should set goals that we can't obtain, though, because we have to feel that sense of accomplishment, right? We want to be able to set smaller goals that we can attain, though. So be, keep that in mind as we go through this. You know, this is an important aspect of every job, though, setting goals. We, we have to be able to set those. But the, the question is this, is what kind do you set? Like what, what metrics do you monitor? So what does that look like? So, you know, let's get serious about it. Let's, let's break this down and talk about your career and find out what kind of goals you should be setting and what those look like. So today I'm going to share a five-step pro process that I've used a few times and I've found some success with this. Um, so let's get straight into it. This five-step guide to setting goals is this, make a list of your goals. This is number one. Make a list of your goals. Don't overthink this at all. Think about every aspect of your life, either health, exercise, um, business, uh, finances, uh, real estate. Just begin to write. Write them all down. Now, I'll, I'll touch on a couple things before I move forward. Is I'm a big fan of paper, paper journals um, and planners. I use them more so for journaling and goal setting than I actually do for my everyday planner. I use my phone for my plan uh, for my uh, for my actual planner. It's just easier. I can set reminders. Obviously, technology. But I will do a quick little uh, shout out to a couple of uh, journals and planners that I'd really do like, and specifically for the goal setting aspect of this is the first one is the full focus planner. I don't know if it'll come in focus, but it looks like this. There's the full focus planner. That's what it looks like, the logo there. Um, it is by Michael Hyatt. Um, it is a really good uh, planner if you are looking for one for goal setting. 
but it does a couple things at the very beginning. It has a list of uh, goal statements, your annual goals. It breaks down uh, goal t- details. And really, it just takes you through an uh, exercise of just beginning to write down just anything that you would like to accomplish in your life. It just You just begin to write stuff down. These are not your final goals, but these are the ones that just basically you say, yeah, I'd love to accomplish these things. Then you take that list, you take all that list, and you begin to pick out the ones that are the most advantageous to helping you develop and the ones that are actionable in the moment that you're that you find yourself in so but the first step is just to write them down on paper the other book that I, the other plan this was about this is a little expensive this is three months and it's like 50 bucks i'm not saying it's a bad thing you can at least do it once and you're going to get a lot of meat out of this and then you can transition to another type planner if you want and i, I have done so i use the goal crazy one right here it's only uh, 30 bucks so it's a little bit cheaper um so this one you know has some really good stuff it's it's really clean it has some goal setting sheets at the very beginning um that you can go through so so I do recommend this if you're more budget conscious, um, and I love profits. I don't like expenses. So this one's a little bit more budget friendly, but this has got some good practice, practical steps to take. So here's my recommendation. I would say buy this one first. Buy the Full Focus Planner first. Go through the activity pages and kind of get your ideal week set up, your goals, those type of things. And if you like it and that's in your budget, continue to use it because it is a really, really good really good planner. But once you get those things, you can also use the Go Crazy Planner. It's a good setup too. Now. This, I'm not, I don't get anything if you buy these, by the way. <laughs> there's no There's no benefit to this. I'm just telling you what I use. Uh, but this is these are two that I find very helpful. So make a list of all your goals. Once you figure out what those are, now begin to pull out four or five that, that you say, look, I, these are actionable items. These are the ones that I can actually do. And then pull those out. And those are the ones, now we're going to move on to step two, is write down the steps that you need to take in order to complete these goals. So if you're talking about uh, uh, closings of properties, how many properties do you want to close? Start thinking backwards. Okay, here's the closing. What do I got to do to get the person to the closing table? And you go all the way back to the beginning on how you get leads, right? So you begin to figure out how many calls I need to make, how many door knocks, how many uh, uh, Facebook posts, social media posts, whatever, whatever your lead source is, you go back to the beginning. You say, how many of those do I need to enter in to make this amount of transactions? So you start with the end result and you work yourself backwards to find out where the starting point is and you use that as your metric. All right, so write down the steps that you need to take in order to complete these goals. Now, number three is create achievable deadlines for each goal with an end date when you will be finished. All right, so a lot of times, and now we've read this as a, a together before, we have read uh, The 12 Week Year. And that's a really cool book because he basically sets goals for every 12 weeks and he operates that way. So instead of saying, set a yearly goal, he sets 12 week goals multiple times. So there are smaller goals that are more achievable. So throughout the year, you are having more success, therefore more award, reward for setting those goals. So a 12-week year, I highly, uh, Brian Morin is the off. Yeah, Brian Morin is the author of that book, 12-week year. It is a great book. I encourage you guys to pick that one up. Smaller goals, but create achievable deadlines. So if you're saying, I want to close two properties, you know, a month, and you're saying for the next three months or maybe five properties, whatever that goal is, then you'll say, you know, January, February, and March, I need six, 10 closings, right? So you know that's the goal. Now you then begin to work back and you begin to figure out how many calls and how many contacts you got to have to get there, right? All right. Number four is you break down your tasks into smaller chunks and assign them to specific um, uh specific days or weeks that you can stay on top of everything. So this is where it gets a little bit more specific. This is when you take those goals and you assign time blocks. This is going back to the ideal week inside of the Full Focus Planner. It's a project that he has you go through, a, a, a way to basically take all the tasks that you do on a daily basis and time block in your planner certain times that you're going to do certain things. So what you'll do is you'll set your goals you'll then begin to break those things down into individual tasks that you'll do. So if it's making cold calls or door knocking, that is a specific time block inside of your ideal week. So every day or three times a week or whatever that is, you will block off a set amount of time that you're gonna do those activities. So set your goals, then make achievable um, aspects to that, and then figure out your task to be able to add that in. All right. So once you begin to build that ideal week and you start framing and time framing everything, now you do need to reward yourself. Number five, reward yourself after completing each task. This will motivate you to keep going. Okay, it will. It'll keep you on point. So if it's if you're setting every three months goals, if you're doing three month uh, goals, then at the end of the three months, you need to figure out exactly what um, 
what what you need to do. I mean, you need to, you need to break that down and figure out how oh, I'm going to do this. Now what? Do I go on vacation somewhere? Do I? I mean, what is it that I want out of this? Do I just go out to a nice big steak dinner if it's a smaller goal? Like what what is it you're going to do for, to reward yourself for that? Right. So that's 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 the key right there. All right. Here's another question for you, and I'm going to go. I'm going to give you this question, and I'm going to go back in and give you. Um, uh, some uh, we're gonna go to the comments here and bring up some of those. So, question: What is your biggest obstacle in achieving your goals? What is the biggest obstacle that gets in the way of you achieving your goals? All right, let's bring up some some uh, comments here. Practice. There you go. Yes, practice is good. Uh, Emily. Um, Oh, there it goes. Calm down. We're so busy that our minds are racing constantly. At least mine is. <laughs> yes, I could relate. That's good. Uh, and yes, making sure I have enough units for th the, uh, the, yes, the top agent retreat. Central 21 agents get to go top agent retreat when they have so many units sold. That is a phenomenal goal for so you see 21 agents that are listening. Yes, and set that goal. Because, man, Central 21 rolls out the red carpet for you all. It is a fun trip. You guys are going to Hawaii, and you guys are beginning the countdown days. And that is awesome. Um, and Emily completely agrees with that. Amen, Ann. <laughs> so, and then Emily on the follow-up to the end there is Tom. Yes. You know, it's funny. We talk, we focus so much on our finances. We focus on so much money and, and where our money goes and, you know, how can we, you know, set budgets and all these type of things. Do you realize that budgeting is actually time because the amount of money you earn is based on how you manage your time? So, Emily, you are correct. It is time. This is time blocking. So, if you set these goals, it is the time blocking that's going to make it possible to reach and have the financial gain that you can then budget from. But it is time that you've got to get under control first and foremost. Thank Thank you, Emily. Um, let's bring up each one of those points for those that are watching real quick and leave them up there for just a second. And we'll talk about these just briefly so you guys can write those down and then we'll move right straight on. So the first one, make a list of your goals. And you guys can always go back and watch this. Make a list of your goals. Write down the steps that you need to take in order to complete these goals. Create achievable deadlines for each goal with an end date when you will be finished. There it is. Break down your tasks into smaller chunks and assign them to specific days or weeks so that you can stay on top of everything. And finally, reward yourself after completing each task. This will motivate you to keep going. Jessica says, warp sense of time. I think I can do more than I can in short in a short time span. Time management is crucial. Amen. Yes, we all have the same time in our day. It's how we use it. We've heard this many times, but we all need to be reminded of that constantly because things can just get out of out of whack. Warp sense of time is good. <laughs> Warp sense of time. So here's here's kind of some of my answers to this question. This is some of the ones that um, I've struggled with. Just to be completely transparent with you guys, is not enough time. Just like what Jessica said, I have made that comment before. I just don't have enough time. And that is a self-reflection of me. That is on me. I didn't manage my time. So I have to internally look at that and say, that's my fault. The next one is my fault as well. Lack of motivation. I set the goal and I love the goal. I want to reach for the goal. And then I get going and I get burnt out on life and everything happens. And I lose the motivation to stay focused on those type of things. And I lose my motivation. So lack of motivation is my other one. And the final one is too many distractions. You know, you, you've, you've probably seen the movie Up. If you haven't watched it, it's pretty funny. It's kind of, it's really sad though too. But there's a dog in there and he has a little collar on that he translates what he says and he sees a squirrel and he just, squirrel, that's me. I have a tendency to get distracted all the time. There's emails and texts and phone calls and all this kind of stuff going on and social media and family and work. And there's just things that are going on that I get derailed from my time blocks almost every single day. So if you're guilty of that, let me know because I, I know I am. I don't, I, I made the statement of not enough time and I've lacked motivation and I've had too many distractions. Now, let's talk about this too. Let's break down this and we'll, we'll wrap this up. These are some of the things that I say as real estate agents and what they should track. Uh, these, are, these are things that you should know to be able to work towards setting goals 
four. And they are the ones, these are the building blocks for most real estate agents in their goal setting. Um, if you're with Century 21 and you're watching this, we have on inside of our uh, systems and tools, we have a program called Business Tool Planner. And it breaks down a lot of these type of things for you guys. Um, and, but these are the ones that I would say, if you're a real estate agent, these are crucial for your business and to understand these numbers. Um, and I'm going to give you what those things are, and I'm going to give you the national averages of what those things are. So you can have a base cause you might be new and you might not have those numbers and you've got to adjust it to, you know, your market that you find yourself in. And I can help kind of do that real quick as well. But here it is. Uh, item number one is this simply the desired income that you want. If it's a three month, six month, or a year goal, what is that desired income? Okay. What is that desired income? Next is the amount of days. Oh, well, uh, national average. I said I was going to give that. National average for what the desired income is for agents is 120000 a year. Now, if you're new, I would say set goals that are reasonable and obtainable. So if you're brand new and you're in the Kentucky market or a more rural market, you're looking at 20 to 50,000, 60,000, somewhere in that zone should be your goal, depending on the context and how much you work towards your goal. The next question is this work days. How many days a year are you going to work? You do need to take time off. You need to be able to rest and take time off. So be sure to allocate that. The average days that real estate agents have said that they work is 220 a year. Now that averages out. Some agents will take off early. You know, they're not just saying, hey, I take off, you know, these vacation blocks. What they're saying is that they might take half days and weeks off for fall and spring break and summer and Christmas, but they're also taking half days to do, you know, personal things. So the average is 220. So you need to know what the working days that you're going to do are. The daily contacts. How many daily contacts is it going to take? This is where we start getting into the ideal week, time blocking, those type of things. How many contacts do I need to do on a daily basis to meet that goal? Okay, so if we use the same math and we said my, my average is $120,000 of income that I want to earn, I'm going to work 220 days, that means the daily contacts on average needs to be about 13. So you need to have 13 lead sources. You need to have 13 contacts coming in every single day, either whatever your lead source may be, right? 13 ways of that funnel bringing those leads in to equal into that $120,000. But then you got to break that down into buyer sides and seller sides, right? You can get as geeky as you want on these type of numbers, but these are some frameworks for you guys to work from. Sometimes people like with Ann, what she was saying is tracking her sides. So maybe it's not the dollar amount that she's worried about because if she gets the side transactions, she's going to have the volume and the, and the income to justify the volume. So here are the average sides. So let's do the same math. The daily total sides that you open with a buyer needs to be at 14 to get 120,000. Total listings, if you want to get $120,000 of GCI coming in, you're going to average around 21 to 32 properties closed, listings taken, maybe 21 with 14 buyers, okay? Total units, the total amount of units that you need to have open, these are not the ones that closed, you need to average about 35 because some deals you open and some of them fall through. That would put you around the 21 to 32 closed properties, depending on how good you are. <laughs> and how difficult your clients are and how active you listen to what they need. <laughs> so that's the average. And then total closings, you're looking at about 31. You want to make $120,000, you're looking at on average, across the board, 31 closed transactions will get you that. So those are some numbers to track. Desired income, work days, daily contacts, total sides open, total uh, listings taken, total units open, and total closings. You can use and set goals based on any of those metrics. You don't have to go in here and say, well, I do all the math. I want to make $120,000. I want to work 220 days. No, you can say, look, I want to have uh, 21 closings in a year. That could be the simplest, simplest goal that you can set. Or I want, like Anne was saying, you know, to earn top agent retreat. Find out what that number is and plug that in and say, this is what I want. Then you work your way backwards from that. Well, how much money do I average, you know, commission per each sale? What does that look like? What's the average selling price of the home that I list and sell? And you begin to work backwards from that and you can figure out how many closings you've got to have to reach that number and how, how many sides you've got to open. How many out of 10 closings, how many of them go to closing? Do you, do you see that you're doing about 80%, which is actually the national average is 80%. So if you open 10, two fall through, eight close. If that's your average, then you can work that number back as well and set a goal based on that number. 
So you can track just one of these things and set a goal on that. And you can divide it up by, you know, four for the calendar year and set one for each quarter and see how you're going and adjust your goal throughout the year accordingly. So you can kind of see that this, you know, goal setting does not need to be complicated and it, and it really shouldn't be. It should be just as simple as setting some just basic numbers and knowing where you're, what you're aiming for and what you're shooting for and then breaking those things down into time blocks in your day and then do not neglect the time. Do not neglect it. Don't let too many distractions enter into that time. Do not lose the motivation. If you find that you're losing the motivation, I tell you the best way to do that is to rein yourself with others that are wanting to do the exact same thing. Get in a group of agents that are wanting to do the same thing, focus on their business, grow themselves, and really, really meet, uh, meet their goals, right? And then don't lie to yourself that there's not enough time. There's absolutely enough time. We just got to adjust things a certain way to be able to find the time. And these type of activities will help you to do so. You know, I hope the hope that this has helped frame a little bit of what goal setting should look like for you guys. And also understanding the importance of actually setting goals. You know, the goal setting process should be a regular part of your life. It should be a regular part of your personal and business life. And, you know, I've got to be honest, it does feel like work at first. It does feel like, man, I'm setting these goals and I never hit them. Then adjust the goals. Adjust the goals to where you're actually hitting them. So I know following these steps, are not, it's not a magic little pill that you just follow these steps and all of a sudden you make all kinds of money. But if you implement all these little nuggets, little by little, into your business plan, you will grow a strong real estate business. I assure you that. I've seen it many, many times. We have agents watching this right now that can actually be a testament to that because I know they set goals. I know them. I know they have. And they have seen a major success from doing so. All right, let's see what we got. I thank you all so much. All right, uh, Ann, if you have the closed units, the money will be there. That's right, Ann. That's exactly it. If you, if, you, if you know exactly what your units are and what, and what that breakdown is, you'll know exactly how much money. Well, you won't know exactly, you'll, you'll, you'll make money. You'll make the money you need. I love the traction of units. Tra track how many units you close, right? It's a great, easy metric. How many do I want to close? It's a great target. You're going to make money. You're going to make money. All right. Awesome. I hope you guys have seen some value in this show. We are, we are coming towards the end here. Um, please, if you did find value, uh, consider subscribing if you haven't already. Thank you. Um, hey, and I want to do this real quick. Feel free to answer any of those questions we asked in the comments. Um, just love to engage. We'll engage even after the show if we need to. Um, so answer it as you go. We want to engage. Um, so next week, though, next week, this is cool. I've got Dr. Travis Freeman coming on the show. Some of you guys might know who he is. Maybe you don't. Um, but he is the son of one of our very own agents in Corbin, Larry Freeman. And it's a very interesting story. And uh, you might have heard of the movie 23 Blast. 23 Blast. It was a story about his life. And um, here is a little bit of a synopsis of his bio, just so you can kind of uh, get to know him just a little bit before the live show. Um, here, here it is. Dr. Travis Freeman is a 1999 graduate of Corbin High School, where he was a top 10 student and four-year letterman for the Red, Red Hound football team. After losing his sight at the age of 12 due to a severe, severe infection, Travis played backup center for the Red Hounds from 1995 to 1998 as America's first blind football player. In 1999, the National High School Athletic Hall of Fame awarded Travis the first annual Travis Freeman Achievement Award, recognizing his achievements on the football field. The major motion picture, 23 Blast, a feature film loosely based on Travis as a blind high school football player, was released in theaters on October 24, 2014, and is now available on DVD, DVD. Also, the book Lights Out, Living in a Sightless World, was released in October of 2014. Lights Out is the complete story of Travis Freeman that inspired 23 Blast. It's going to be a great conversation. We're going to be talking about adversity, right? How we face adversity and what he had to do to play football as a blind person. I mean, that's amazing to me. And the, the amount of, of uh, facing your fear and adversity that, that the world out there says you can't do something, and he did it. He went out there and he did it. I think there's a lot we can all learn from Travis when he comes on the show. So it's going to be a conversation with him just kind of about his life and how he, what happened, how he became blind at the age of 12, um, 
what made him want to play football so bad and kind of the journey that led him to do that. And then we'll talk a little bit about basically the movie, 23 Blast, and and how that came about. And we'll talk about the actors that played him and the and his parents and those type of things. And so it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be really fun. And then I'll, I'll end that show with Brilliant Basic at number five. I am the master of their journey. I'm a master of their journey. And here's the statement that follows that. I know that great real estate agents are customer-centric and expert guides through the real estate journey. I help clients understand the process, interpret complex information, anticipate and solve problems, and ultimately create a seamless and frictionless experience. I remember that the client is in charge of the final decision, but I am in charge of the journey. So I hope you guys will join me next week for a live conversation with Dr. Travis Freeman and deep dive into Brilliant Basin number five, I am the master of their journey. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed this show. Please like, subscribe if you haven't already. And in the meantime, be fearless, keep pushing forward, and never stop being relentless in your pursuit of excellence. I'm Adam Gullett, and I'll see you guys next Friday at 10.30 a.m. Thank you all.